Episode 142 of CPP Cast with guest Patrice Roy, recorded March 21st, 2018. This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. And by JetBrains, maker of intelligent development tools to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for an individual license on the C++ tool of your choice, C-Lion, ReSharp, or C++, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPPCast during checkout at JetBrains.com. In this episode, we talked about the C++ Now schedule. Then we talked to Patrice Roy, who just got back from the Jacksonville C++ committee meeting. Patrice talks to us about the state of upcoming C++ features, new study groups, and more. Welcome to episode 142 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Uh, I don't really have too much to share. I just kind of want to jump into this interview, right? Well, yeah, I'm sure our guest has lots of interesting things to tell us today. Okay. Well. Ha, rumors, rumors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Real- look at that. The guest's jumping in too yeah, early. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick, though, let's read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week we got an email from Rodrigo. Uh, he's a Mexican developer living in Portugal, and he wrote in that he enjoys CPP Cast and wants to thank us for doing it. He says he wished he lived in a city with a C++ user group, but you never get what you want. Um, and he said as a regular uh, Cinder user, uh, he wanted to suggest Andrew Bell as a guest for the show. Um, we have talked about Cinder a, a while ago. That was a really early I episode with Vittorio so, yeah. Romeo. Um, but it would be great to have uh, you know Andrew Bell. I'm assuming he's the, the creator, if not a major contributor of the library. I've not actually used Cinder, have you? No, I have not, but it seems like a great library. And, you know, and I am curious, since we, we have this conversation relatively often with our European guests, that in a mixed environment, they tend to speak English at their offices, right? Mm-hmm. If it's people from various parts of Europe. And I was just curious, uh, Mexican, it would be a presumably native Spanish speaker. And in Portuguese, yeah. yeah, Portuguese is related to Spanish, but it's certainly not the same language. I'm very curious if they speak Portuguese in their office or if they speak English or not. Maybe he can write in and let us know. Yeah, let us know, Rodrigo. And, and the one thing I'll say is, you know, if you don't have a, a C++ user group right now in your area... Look for other C++ developers and get one started. You know, that, that's how user groups get formed. Right, Jason? Yeah, yeah, that's, yes. You just put one up and see who shows up. Pretty much. Meetup.com, really easy way to get it all running. Okay, well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, joining us today, again, is Patrice Roy. Patrice has been playing with C++ either professionally for pleasure or for or most of the time, both for over 20 years. After a few years doing R&D work and working on military flight simulators, he moved on to academics and has been teaching computer science since 1998. Since 2005, he's been involved more specifically in helping graduate students and professionals from the fields of real-time systems and game programming develop the skills they need to face today's challenges. The rapid evolution of C++ in recent years has made his job even more enjoyable. He's been a participating member in the ISO C++ Standards Committee since late 2014 and has been involved with the ISO Programming Language Vulnerability since late 2015. He has five kids and his wife ensures their house is home to a continuously changing number of cats, dogs, and other animals. Patrice, welcome back to the show. Well, well glad to be there. <clears throat> and since I'm home tonight, you might be hearing some of their, these beasties at some <laughs> point. So what is the menagerie up to at this point? Oh, it's a very low number. There's only nine cats in the house right now. It's the lowest we've had in years. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I can assure you that if uh, my wife were to walk into that house, she would not be able to see because of her allergies. Yeah, that happens. But, but the, the, we've we've got up to twenty five for a while, but it's it's nine right now. It's a lower number. There's three dogs. There's one that's not ours. Three birds, and yeah, life. <laughs> That's great. Oh, yes. Life. You can ensure that the house is always full of life at that point, I guess. There are places calmer than my house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Patrice, we've got a couple of news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll, uh, we have plenty of questions about uh, everything that happened down in Jacksonville this year. Okay? <laughs> of course. Last week. Okay. Uh, first one. C++ NAB 2018 schedule's up, right, Jason? The schedule is up, yes. Lots of good stuff on here, it looks like. I realize I what didn't even awesome. check to see what talk you have that made it in here. Initializer lists are broken. Let's fix them. Yes. <laughs> okay. That is my talk. We can ask Patrice's opinion. Do you agree uh, initializer lists are broken? Not completely. Not completely, but... Not we, completely. We, we, there are things to fix. It's it, th th there's so many good things about it. It's sad that the bad things show up so much. But I, when I saw your your talk's title, I was enjoying myself a lot. Many people think like you do. The the fixes are very difficult to find. It's it's a tricky thing to fix. Yeah, we will. Uh, I don't know. We'll see what I come up with in time for the conference. <laughs> well, there's that, and there's the aggregate initializers that that follow the same syntax, and there's the default initialization with a pair of braces that that I think is awesome. There's many good things about it, but you no, know, it's it's the, the the vector int situation is very unpleasant. Yes, and I am yeah specifically referring to the actual initializer list object itself, the thing that is creating for you behind the scenes, yes. Uh, I'd like to be in the room listening to you hacking through that thing. I'm very, very <laughs> curious, but I'll be watching it on the internet at some point. Right. You will not be making it to C++ now again, I, I assume. I, I, I would love that. It's one of the conferences that sounds so, so cool. I was looking at the listings today, and damn, it looks good, but it doesn't fit well with my teaching schedule. Right. Yes, and, and for those who have not yet signed up for it, go buy a ticket now, talk to your employer, do what you need to do. Uh, it is definitely the conference to go to if you're interested in, well, people who are tearing apart the language, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> no, it's the conference that does that. Yes. Uh, is there any other talk you wanted to highlight, Jason? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I had a few places myself where I couldn't decide which talk to go to, but... There's yeah. one about quantum data structures for classical computers. That sounds interesting. Yeah, that's it's, Peter. Yeah, yeah, uh, 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 Charles Bay, I think. Uh, oh, oh. Is, is relocatable is something that we've talked about on the internet a few times. That's interesting. Archer is going to be talking about that. Archer Dwyer, please allow me to say, he's got a book out. I got a copy. I didn't finish it yet. It sounds really, really cool. So if you get yeah. a chance to look at Archer Dwyer's STL book, Mastering the STL, it really seems interesting. I think we mentioned that a few episodes ago. Yeah, two weeks ago, I think, or so. Yeah, I think we did. Okay. And, but there's a number of cool talks. Something about efficiency by Alan Talbot, I could see. Something about data parallelism by Jeff Hammond. Your, your talk seems interesting. Uh, Bob Stegall's Fancy Pointers, uh, things by Odin Holmes. It's an awesome conference. Yeah. And, and yeah, I misspoke when I said that was Peter, and you're totally right. <laughs> yes. Uh, P Peter's talk, uh, at least one... Uh, Coming up here, a view to a view looks like it could be interesting. Mm. Definitely. There's so many people that are uh, have been guests on the show that are will be speaking <laughs> at this conference. <laughs> well, yeah. your show's very good, yeah. Well, thank you. I, there's a couple names I didn't recognize, though, who uh, we might need to try to get on the show. I saw there were two talks by uh, Jason Rice. One's on Docker-based C++ dependency and build management. That sounds like it would be interesting. It's I a believe, hot topic. Yeah. yeah. I believe Jason is a regular at this conference, if it's who I'm thinking of. Okay. Well, uh, next article yes. we have is text formatting at the ISO C++ standards meeting in Jacksonville. And this is an article from the author of the proposal uh, <clears throat> to get formatting into C++. And uh, it's based on the format library. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like it, it's going well, and it's 
on track to be in standardization, I, I believe, right? It's got a good reception from what okay. I understand. I wasn't in a room when they discussed that. Uh, it wasn't accepted. They talked about it. Uh, the yet. votes okay. were uh, mostly four. Uh, there's some fixes to do. But uh, it, it's, it's cool. People tend not to like the um, IO stream style formatting. They find it's a bit too long. I don't mind personally. I, I, I meant about the implementation, but not the syntax. It doesn't bother me that much. But I think people will like what Victor is doing. It, it, it looks like what people are used to. It does lots of compile time stuff. There's some interesting macros in there <laughs> that are very, very funny. Yeah, so, I think yeah, it's very it similar like to like Python and, and C Sharp and I'm sure other languages style uh, string formatting. Yeah. And since the compile time strings are really coming our way, it's, it's probably going to be a good match for what he's doing. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that he said one of the things that he had to address was compile time string format processing, but from the last one to the current one. But it's coming, it's coming. So I'm curious, though, it has, he, uh, the author gave us the list of how many votes were strongly for, for uh, neutral, against, and strongly against. And you said it was not accepted. And I'm curious, like, what does it, what does it take for it to be accepted? What does this vote have to look like? <clears throat> It depends on what the question was. Uh, okay. Was the, the question, do we encourage the author to pursue? Was the question being asked, do we like the direction this thing is going? Uh, I, I wasn't there, so. but my, my guess is he presented what he's done. He asked a number of design questions, probably. He got answers, he got guidance. And my feeling is that since it was probably an encouragement vote, it's going to go back home, fix a few things, and then come back with something that's stronger. And if both LEWG and he feel good about it, it's going to move on to LWG and then maybe get into the standard for 20 or 23. Okay. Okay, and then this next one we have, and uh, this might just kind of flow into the rest of the show. Uh, <laughs> we have an ISO C++ trip report on Reddit, and uh, it was uh, Bryce Lalback who put this together and went into uh, just a good overview of what was discussed at the meeting and uh, also w what the um, the targets are for what might make it into C++20 <laughs> yes. or C++23. And, and it, maybe it's worth starting there because I, I'm really glad that this was put out there and uh, I'm sure that this is the committee kind of wanting to be honest with the community about what is going to make it and, and don't get people too excited because that's kind of what happened with sequels 17. We were expecting a lot more and some people were let down. And uh, this list basically is saying conservatively, we think there's going to be at least, you know, these two major features and optimistically there could be like six more features. So it'll probably be somewhere in between. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> That's when we're putting it. The, yeah. the, some big features are really coming in. We have concepts. You know, we have concepts. Right. We, so concepts was officially approved. Uh, it was approved at the uh, Toronto meeting. The uh, w w what's still floating is the terse syntax issue because there are disagreements since there are quite cases where something could be a type or a non-type. Some people think it's not a problem. Some people think it is a problem. So that's why this thing has the favor of a short majority of people. So that's not consensus. So concepts are in and there's still discussions going on about parts of the syntax. Uh, modules uh, are, are, have made the progress in a surprisingly and interesting uh, manner at the Jacksonville meeting because the two, let's put it that way, the two competing approaches found a lot of common ground and have told us that they would be co-writing something for the next meeting. So uh, I got out of that meeting with um, uh, hope for the module's proposal. I think we could actually get something for C++20. It sounds solid now. So that's okay. pretty major. <laughs> Since we're talking about modules, I've seen lots of comments going back and forth where effectively a lot of uh, developers don't want modules if they shoehorn in macro support, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, you're, we're going to get whatever we agree on because it's a political <laughs> issue. <laughs> Uh, the the I, I don't think we're going to be able to escape the macros entirely because there's too much code depending on it. 
it's not a fresh start where we drop everything and start over again. It's not going to be like that. I don't think so, at least. But we'll see. You know what the two... As I said, the two competing approaches from two major contributors seem to be going in the direction of something that fuses the common parts. So at least to get something to C++20, I think there's serious hope that there will be modules in some form. That's not to say it won't evolve after that, but we're going to have something, I think. It's, it sounds good. Okay. Yeah, and in this trip report, it, it mentions that an entire day was spent discussing uh, modules in the Library Evolution Working Group. And that was not the biggest part of the meeting. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't there at that part. Some people are getting saturated with modules. It's a very big thing. It's been going on for a long while. Some people are not as interested as they used to be, but we're going to get them and they're going to be useful. They won't be miraculous, but they're going to be useful. The biggest thing wasn't that. It was integers. Really? Integers. Sure. Integers. <laughs> we had this like, proposal, yeah, yeah, integers, signed integers, signed overflow, integers, yeah. and to, and to complement. That was a very big issue during the week. Yeah, I didn't actually uh, realize that it was discussed. I don't recall reading it in here. But, no, uh, it took a day and a half. It was the biggest SG six meeting I've ever seen. SG six is numerics. I wanted oh, to go okay. there because the undefined behavior people were going there too. I work with them most of the time, but the the, the place was jam packed. Uh, there was this proposal to make all signed integers to complement in C++ and essentially remove undefined behavior on overflow. Okay, so are we aware of any currently existing hardware that does not use two's complement? Well, th that was the beauty of it. The guys have done their research, and they, they checked a number of, 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 of hardware and vendors, and the only pieces of hardware we could find that do not have two's complement do not have a C++ compiler. Oh. Okay. So, yeah. so it was a surprisingly successful proposal. It didn't pass because it's a big thing, but there were a day, there was a day and a half of discussion there, and it was surprisingly serene. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, I, I, I'm struggling to think of where hardware even needs to support two's complement. Like arithmetic shift right needs to know if it's if it needs to extend to the sign bit, but but. From a CPU perspective, for the most part, the beauty of two's complement is that it just works with addition and subtraction. And well, I guess you need to you need to complement you need to negating a value needs to know that it's two's complement in the hardware. Yeah, the 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 undefined behaviorness or not of overflow is an issue too. Then do okay. you detect an error? Do you report it? What do you do with that thing? It's a sensitive issue, but right. I, I, we, we could have had an explosion. It was very well managed by all participants, and we had progress, and I think we're going to have another paper at the next meeting, and uh, the language is going to change in a fundamental way with that. So you th plausibly, two's complement will be the defined way that signed integers are implemented. I couldn't swear anything, but sure. I, I, I couldn't have believed that at first, and after that meeting, yeah, I think it's a possibility. That's and so the main author of that paper is that JF. Yeah, J JF likes controversy. He's very he's very good with that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but he, he's amazingly efficient. I mean, he managed this like a like a yeah like a champion. Wow, that's JF Bastian. We we've had him on the show before just for the sake of our uh, oh, yeah, listeners. Here. <laughs> a long time ago, we're talking about WebAssembly <clears throat> when that was uh, still being just an idea, really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, he's one of the uh, the uh, the engineers behind that thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, that's um, arguably the main category of undefined behavior that affects real programmers. Yeah, I'm not sure everyone understands what they're doing when they're doing signed overflow. They they expect their machine to be doing the right thing or their compiler to be doing the right thing, but they're in UB land all the time. So yeah, they're working on false beliefs. So at least we could get something that actually makes sense and results in portable behavior. We'll see. But that That's was okay. one big thing. Yeah, there were many things during that week. It was a busy week. <laughs> well, uh, we're still talking about core language things, our major features, I guess. Are we still talking about major features? As you uh, wish. Yeah, I mean, is there any other news uh, with major features <clears throat> being worked on? I mean, we, we just briefly spoke about concepts and, and modules. I have... 
Yeah, I'd say cool routines are going forward also. We, we've made progress. There's still things to work on, but uh, we were uh, we had an evening on cool routines or an afternoon on cool routines. And even those who don't think it's ready want it. So I think there's hope for cool routines also, which is a That's pretty cool thing. Yeah. I'm really curious about this executors thing because it was only recently brought to my attention. And we've been talking about the networking TS for... I don't know, years on the, mm-hmm. on the show, right, Rob? Yeah, I mean, networking's yeah. come up many times, but what are these executors and why does networking rely on them and why don't we have executors if networking requires it? And <laughs> <laughs> So I, I went and did some research to make sure I didn't say anything that was too wrong. I'm not, uh, I don't sit at SG1 that often, so I follow the things from a, an outsider's perspective still. Right. So uh, an executor, what it does is model the execution of agents. <clears throat> it tells you if they have completed, uh, if they have completed well or not, uh, how they are being distributed among machines or among among cores or among threads. It manages the execution of things. And there's many kinds. There's uh, the one-way executor, the two-way that returns some result, the then to do future dot then and chain things into continuations. Uh, you can bolt them together so you can do fire and forget for a number of agents at once or send a rev then and pack the executions into a big array and send it back. So they model the way that the computations are being re- uh, distributed on your hardware. They're, they're an essential part of what concurrency will be in C++ starting now. And okay. they're a big thing. And the networking that exists based on Boost AO, uh, ACO is cool, mm. but it's been rebased on executors for C++ 20 okay. and up because future.then, fibers, everything kind of relies on executors. It's the abstraction that we're putting underneath it all. So lots of things depend on executors, and we really, really need them soon. Okay, I'm going to put on my cynic cat for just a moment, uh, and, and hopefully I don't go too far down the cynicism route, but occasionally things can come across as being over-engineered and being far more flexible than the actual like average programmer needs. And now you're talking about the executors as modeling the way that concurrency happens on your hardware Will the average programmer be able to understand this executor thing, or is it going to be like this black box that we just have to deal with? <laughs> you probably won't see it from a programmer's perspective, although okay. from what I can understand, there are a number of customization points in there where you can tweak things to make them behave the way you want to if you're an expert. There's prior art for that. There are executors in Java and other languages, so it's something that is quite well understood. There's okay. a sound basis for that. Okay. <clears throat> it gives you guarantees on blocking, progress, and other things. So it's a way to model concurrency, parallelism, uh, forward progress when you're computing. Okay. It's a solid thing. And we, to be honest, we, we need this, and we've needed this for a while, but for all the new concurrency and parallel stuff, to make it work properly, we kind of need that. The, now, the thing is, will we get that for C++ 20 or 23? Right. Uh, there, there's the, the SG-1 people have presented two options. One of them is we wait for 23 and we get a bunch of stuff at the same time. Or we push the, the ones that are ready for 20 and we try to get with networking running right away. Uh, th- those two options are on the table. I don't know where we're going to go. We're being asked to think about it. So we might get networking and basic ex- executors for 20 and the rest in 23. Or we could get everything in 23 all at once. I don't know right now what it's going to be. Okay. okay. Interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. If you look at the specs, there's, it's, it's, I wouldn't say over engineered, but it's, it's a way to think about the way things execute on your machine. So it, 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 it makes you think. That's a good proposal. All right. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is a debugging platform that improves software quality, reliability, and support by bringing deep introspection and automation throughout the software error lifecycle. Spend less time debugging and reduce your mean time to resolution by using the first and only platform to combine symbolic debugging, error aggregation, and state analysis. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of application and environmental state. Backtrace then performs automated analysis on process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. This data is aggregated and archived in a centralized object store, 
providing your team a single system to investigate errors across your environments. Join industry leaders like Fastly, Message Systems, and AppNexus that use Backtrace to modernize their debugging infrastructure. It's free to try, minutes to set up, fully featured with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. How about ranges? Um, the conservative target is saying the core of ranges are going to be in C++20 and the rest in C++23. What, what exactly do we mean by the rest of ranges? Yeah, I, I had to look this up because I wasn't in the room for that one. I was in core when that was being discussed. But I, I think it's it's a misnomer, to be honest. I, now, don't quote me on that because I've been going through papers, my, my note taking there because I was a secretary at the meeting and everything. There has been no core range proposal being accepted uh, in the meeting. But uh, <clears throat> the standard library concepts, P0898, have been uh, pushed from LEWG to LWG, and ranges do depend on that. So my guess is that's what people meant when they said that the core range was being accepted. It's, it's gone to, a, uh, to LWG for wording now. So that thing is the concepts on which the ranges are based on. Okay. So that, okay. That, that is my understanding of things, but if I'm mistaken, I'm sorry, but I, that everything that's what's going on. Uh, the ranges TS and the complexity requirements were discussed, but not forwarded. So that means LEWG has worked on it. They're probably good. They might, they might get into C++20, but I don't, it, they would have to go from LEWG to LWG during the next meeting, which is something that happens sometimes. You now, if they're almost ready, they discuss it in library evolution, and then they push it to library, and then it just gets the wording, and that's done. But depends on the the, the size of that thing. I haven't looked at it, <clears throat> so that, that's what I think happened. So the the concepts for library are there, which is probably what they call the core of the ranges, but uh -huh. the ranges aren't there yet. Okay, so perhaps to summarize, four ranges to get in, we needed concepts. Then we needed the concepts that ranges rely on. Then we need ranges themselves. <laughs> Yeah, we could make we could make ranges work without the concepts, but it would be a major rewrite, and I don't think it's worth it. Yeah, no, that that doesn't seem sound worth it. And I think this is probably a good point to take one step back and ask you what your role actually was <laughs> at this meeting, <laughs> as we keep badgering you with questions. That's okay. I'm there for that. So I I, I replaced Jonathan Wakeley as secretary for the second time. I'd done that in Toronto before okay. uh, because uh, I don't mind I, I type all the time I take notes so I don't mind taking notes for the committee it's more formal of course there are rules and everything but I did that and I, I spent most of my week in core because we had a number of very interesting things to do there so that's where I spent most of my time I did all of the evening sessions to my knowledge uh, I'm saying to my knowledge but there were days when we had more than one evening session going on at once so you can't be everywhere at the same time of course it doesn't work uh, yeah, so that's what I did. <clears throat> lots of core wording and uh, lots of uh, secretary work and lots of uh, evening sessions. What what goes on during the evening sessions exactly? Normally, it's things that everyone might want to attend. It's not necessarily as formal as the day work okay. when we are in specific working groups with an agenda and, and votes and stuff. The Monday evening... Uh, evening session was on concepts and the terse syntax. We had, if I remember properly, four proposals there. One by Vittorio Romeo and John Lacos, where they were using the auto keyword to uh, introduce concepts. <clears throat> the, the thing with terse syntax is that sometimes there's a confusion between type and non-type. So mm -hmm. people are working to clarify that. Those who find it annoying. So there was that. There was one by Thomas Koppe, who wanted to use concepts as adjectives. Uh, so you would have the concept name and the type name and, and then your variable. So you would be qualifying your types with this. Uh, there was, would yeah, sorry? I'm curious what the advantage to that would be. It's, well, you know, it's a type when you're using that. You have no confusion and you could have many concepts for the same type. So you could say it's a mergeable and sortable container say, or something. It's almost like a Java uh, interface or something at that point. <laughs> no, it was it was better than that. Right, and I'm sure it was. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, this is a bright game. The, there was uh, one uh, by uh, Bjarne, if I remember, who, who relates the original syntax. 
Uh, I agree with him that it's the most elegant one, but there, there, it's true that there are problems with it. Confusion that might be bad or might not be, depending on your point of view. And there was one that the one that had the biggest support, if I remember properly, was Herbs. Herbs introduces braces uh, after concept names. Uh, you can introduce names with that and reuse them afterwards and make the syntax a bit lighter. It's a bit of an annoyance to have braces there. It's a bit strange, but it does have some technical and syntactic advantages. And his, his plan is to make them go away at some point. So when we're more comfortable, if you have a concept name and a pair of empty braces, uh, because that's just what happened in your syntax, you can just go to the point at some point where the braces go away, and it looks like the original syntax that Bjarne had brought up for years and years on end. So it's seen as a transition path. So we had an evening that uh, that was a three hour and a half meeting in the mm. evening. We ended up at almost 11 o'clock in the evening with that. Um, so that was the first one. There was one on Tuesday on um, uh, new containers for the standard library mm. where uh, people were presenting either their work or some other people's work. I have to tell you that I looked like a clown on that evening. I presented one and I made a total mess out of it. <laughs> Happily enough... No, I, I felt terrible because yeah, I didn't make, I didn't do a good job. It happens. Oh, oh I, I, we really must know what your terrible container was that you presented on that. It, it's, it's not the container that's terrible. It's me who was terrible. Okay, I, I did a terrible hard to job. Believe. No, no, I, I, I really made a mess. It happens. So uh, for a number of reasons that are not to be discussed in this, uh, in this uh, podcast. <laughs> But, but uh, happily enough, all of the other presenters were very good. So we had Casey Carter for a, if I remember properly, a fixed size vector. I may be confusing him with another one. We had Nevin Lieber with a short, a small vector, a small vector that, that starts very small and you can use the small object optimization on. Uh -huh. The other one has a fixed capacity. I might be like confusing one for the other. Okay. Sure. Um, we had, um, I'm sure I'm going to forget one. Uh, we had Colony. Uh, from Matt Bentley, uh, whom you've had in the show before, yes. I think oh, yeah. twice. Talking was Matt there to present it himself? Did someone else present no, it for him? No, he, he lives in New Zealand. He doesn't yeah. come to meetings, really. But, but uh, Nicola Jotis, uh did an awesome job of presenting this. He was very, very, very good. Oh. And he got a very good reception for the crowd. So that's uh, amazing. And I, I, I messed up, but I, I, I still tried to present the slot map from Alan Deutsch, uh, which is a better proposal than what I showed. And uh, there's one that's missing from what I just said. I feel sorry. Ringspan, I see. Ringspan, of course, by, by Guy Davidson, who did a really good job. That one's really cool because it's been going through six revision. It's a good proposal, but sometimes people want a container. Sometimes they want an adapter. Sometimes they want something with specific behavior on pop and push. So it's been going through revision and revision and revision, mostly because... People keep changing their minds, but now Guy was there and got a good reception, and it even went as far as the uh, SG1 chair saying, we want the concurrent version of your thing, and we want it now. So he was very happy mm. about that. Mm. So very good. apart from my, my mess, it was a very good evening. We had the Wednesday... <laughs> I'm going to forget some. We had an evening session for the SG15 group tooling that was on Friday. Oh, right. So that's the brand new group, right? First time yeah. that it's met. But but we have a newer one than that. I'll well, yes, that right. Place. Let's start with the, 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 the oldest new one and then go to the newest <laughs> new one. Yeah, because uh, we, we don't have enough work, you know? So the uh, SG14 uh, had a very good reception. People 15, know that we right? need... Yeah, 15. We, we, need, we need package management. We need uh, tools to deploy. Uh, in fact, the problem is we have too much, too many papers going on in LEWG to process these days. We can't take everything we're getting and, and get them through in a meeting. Mm. They barely got to about half of what they got this time. Wow. So we, we need a different vehicle from the standard library to bring those cool things to people. So there are, there's Boost, of course, that exists. And we're looking for a way to make downloading libraries and installing them easier. So uh, people went to that meeting, people participated very strongly People offered their time and their energy to provide tools and standardize tools and protocols. So um, we, we've given ourselves a 10-year horizon for that. So we, we want in 10 years for people to be able to easily download and install library stuff without bothering. I'm curious if any of the existing 
tooling things out there. I mean, like Conan, for example, is out there doing things. People are actively using it. Was it discussed? Does does what relevance does something like that have in these discussions? Maybe we, we didn't name anything. The goal is to get everyone working together. So it was a first okay. meeting official like that. So yeah, I expect Conan to be contacted. Um, lots of people in the room were actively participating in seminary tools also. There's a number of tools we need. We have a long list. We won't get through everything. But uh, I expect people like the Conan people to be contacted at some point and brought in if they want to participate. So, so it's not just package management tools. It's no, no, no. It's a long list of tools. Um, if you look at, if you like, if you have access to the wiki, you can look at the notes because I took them. They're very detailed. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a long list. We won't do everything that's in there, but we're going to get people working. There was an evening session on, I said, concepts. We had an evening session on Unicode, mm. which has led to the uh, new group, that's SG16, led by Tom Honorman, who's a very courageous man. <laughs> 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 and uh, I'm, I'm missing one. There, was, there were so many. So, yeah, we had evening sessions like that, where each... Oh, there was one on static reflection, very important one. Uh, static reflection is coming to, uh, we could almost, I'd say, I, I'd risk myself saying we could have bits of that, even in C20, the way things are going. That would be nice. Okay. Uh, that, that would be a major feature. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big thing. It's, it's going to be much bigger in C23, but in 20, I can tell you that we are looking ahead to something very nice. The proposals we have are sound. They do good things. Uh, they lead to interesting code. Uh, we had a progress report from Herb on his meta class stuff that, that looks much nicer than it used to. It, it looked nice. It looks nicer today. Uh, we had uh, work by uh, David Senkel and a few others on ways to make context programming nicer. Um, uh, really a uh, very good evening. Yeah. And BRNA presented a, a list of the things that they really would like to have right away. Just to I'm very people. curious what Bjarne's list of things that he would like to have right away is. <laughs> well, he, he acted as a customer, so he, he wants easy serialization and a few other things like that. The, mm -hmm. They're all very simple to do if you have the right tools. He doesn't want people to over-engineer. He wants solutions right away to real-life problems. Uh, so, yeah, we might be getting a few of these. Yeah, it's really cool. So, yeah, I get, you know, reflection would be a requirement for serialization, almost certainly. Well, the 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 the, the, the serialization he, he looks for is something that is based on static reflection. You know, you can uh, infer the names of your enums and then iterate through them and list them and display them, and you can iterate through the members of your class and the member functions. And you know, there are things like that we can already do them. Really, it's a matter of getting them to the standard. Yeah, uh, I would love reflection for my own purposes. But being able to convert an enum to a string, like just that one little thing, if we could do that in some way that did not require macros or a bunch of duplication of values, would be really nice. Well, with, with, with Reflexper, the new operator that we have, if it gets into C++20, you already have that. So okay. Reflexper leads to, it gives you uh, incomplete meta types on which you can reason and from which you can deduce information. There's there's machinery behind that, but with what we have on the table right now, you could do that. You don't need macros anymore to do that. that really, it's awesome. Nice. Oh, yeah, 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 it's really, really cool. But one thing that I could say is that with Jacksonville, you can see the frontier between runtime and compile time slowly disappearing and fading away. Things are moving back and forth between the two. C++ is changing again. That is exactly how it should be. We should yeah. be able to... Make everything const expert. If we want to <laughs> yeah, I heard the rumor. <laughs> but okay, see, see, you, you have these new const expert new coming in, of course. Uh, but but uh, and we have now const expert iterators that we've gotten in to mm -hmm. to make things easier. But with const expert new, you can have const expert vectors and strings. You know. Oh, so did const expert new? I didn't see that on any of the reports. Did that make headway in this meeting? N no, but uh, I expect. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's not been voted, but I expect it to be in. It's really, really, there's a number of things that depend on that. But the new thing that came to core at the very end of the week, you no know, on Friday, is const expert destructors. Well, that needs to happen. Huh. That's, I, in my opinion, way more obvious than const expert new, from my the, use of const expert. But 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 the, the, the perspective, if I understood it properly, because it's pretty abstract, is that you're working at const expert time 
on things like your constexpert vector and you're playing with the memory that doesn't really live in your program because the program isn't there yet. So you're, yes. you're in the interpreter part of your compiler and see doing things. But there are ways now that, that seem to appear of reifying, reifying objects that were constexpert into the runtime world as static objects. And the context for destructors would intervene at the end of your program to do clean up on that static stuff that you've generated at compile time. So it's really a different way of thinking about code. It's very strange and interesting and stimulating. Yeah, the, 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 I see your face right now. But your listeners don't. But yeah, it's the kind of face I made too when I heard that. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about it. Actually, it made me immediately think about it from the teacher's perspective because I really like to teach the fact that the Object lifetime in C++ is something that we can strongly reason about. We, we know when things are created, when things are destroyed. Now, if we have something that began its life at compile time and ends its life at the end of the program execution, that changes a little bit how we think about things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's a very interesting proposal, thought-provoking. You know, it's it's an evolving language. Static reflection does that too, mind you. Yeah? And meta classes too. You're pre-generating stuff before your program starts to run. You're creating classes from code. It's yeah, it's it's a very different language we're going to. It's a very very interesting one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I don't know if it shows, but I had a, I had a great week. Yes, it sounds like you had a, a lot of fun, yeah. <laughs> I want to speak about a few a few small features, if you don't mind. Sure. sure. One of the first things that began my week was new unique address. So you might have heard about that. It's a way to tag your, your uh, data members in a class to say that they do not require a, a specific address because they're empty, you know? Right. That, that's cool for the classes where you would have liked to apply the empty base optimization, but that are marked final, for example. <clears throat> so I didn't the, realize that final actually precluded the ability to use empty base optimization. In the well, you cannot derive from the class, so you cannot be your base. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so you're stuck. So, but okay. that, that thing is interesting because when you start thinking about it, if your different objects have no unique address, they can be anywhere in the class, you see? So you can you can put all of them at the beginning, regardless of where you put them in the list of your data members, you just shove them at the beginning because you don't really care where they are. So we had to wonder what is the impact about uh, of this on trivial layout, say, because right. you're moving the objects around. So so the, the, yeah, it, it's actually interesting. <clears throat> so but but that's very useful for embedded programmers, for people who care about the cache line. People care about speed, of course, and we're actually going to get, in the context of a non-empty object, of course, empty data members. That's that's a new thing and a new way of thinking also. Uh, you might have seen the likely and unlikely attributes also. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I want to go back to no unique address real quick. Come back, please. Does that... Uh... I mean, one of these fundamental things of, of, of undefined behavior, this pointer <laughs> aliasing thing, right, that everyone wants to complain about because they can't reinterpret cast bits however they want to in C++. You no know, unique address means that we could have pointers to different objects that are the same address, correct? Absolutely, absolutely, because they have no unique address. But now is this because we have to actually tag it with an attribute, now the compiler knows, okay, it's fine. I'm just not going to optimize around this thing. Or does it even matter if it's empty? I don't know. What, what are the implications here? <laughs> I have to think about it. Anyway, it's, it's, the compilers can uh, support it or not. They're not forced to. It's just an attribute. So we'll see what they do. It's Q of I. We're, our, our thought processes are going to adapt to that new reality. Yeah. It's like if we ever get regular <laughs> void, we're going to have to think about our code a bit. We need regular <laughs> void. That wasn't mentioned on here at all. I'm guessing there is no movement because Matt, Matt, Matt could have raised when it was into the meeting. That's why we we need to do a uh, like a GoFundMe or something to make sure that he attends all the meetings <laughs> and advances the cause of regular void. <laughs> yeah, it, th th that will be a game changer. Also, if you get that. <laughs> I want to talk about likely because people misunderstand yes. what it's meant. Uh, it's an SG14 thing mm -hmm. by, uh, the, the name is Trita, but I don't know if I pronounce it well. Uh, but people seem to think that we're trying to second guess the compiler saying, we know better than you. What is good for you? Like with your, the register keyword, but that's not really the point. Yeah. Okay. 
the, the point of likely there is to tell the compiler, you're right about the way you see things. You're optimizing for the speedy branches and the frequent branches, and you're right, but I don't want you to do that. I want you to treat that else there that you wouldn't have optimized normally as the optimal one, because I know that when I get there, that's when I want to go fast. Okay. So, so it's for people okay. who don't want the normal code to be optimized. They want abnormal stuff because, for example, they want to exit the program very quickly when something goes wrong or something. So it's a very niche thing, but it's not people trying to think that they optimize better than the compiler. That's not, I, I think, that's not the way I understand that. So we're not just supposed to be. sprinkle it around wherever we think that something is more likely or unli less likely. No, you're going to get into trouble if you do that. And that's actually amusing because if you look at the wording, there's a small number of words describing likely and unlikely. And there's this huge note saying that you're going to get bitten if you abuse because the compiler is better than you are. So the, note, <laughs> the warning note is much bigger than the initial wording. This is like in line, which perpetually annoys me when I see it sprinkled throughout code. Yeah, except maybe for the new inline variables of C17, because. It's oh, yeah, that's new. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inline functions. Yeah. You might have heard about the C date. We're going to have an actual date <laughs> type in the standard. Okay, I think we talked to Howard Hinnon about that, right? Yeah. Well, it's been accepted. This guy is a hero. Like, <laughs> do you have any idea how complicated that thing is to write? It's, it's awesome. So, so we, uh, I, we really, really, really appreciate what he's done for us. And this guy is saving everyone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no one wants it's, it's like Unicode. It's just too complicated. And Howard just went out there and just did it. Uh, we have span now. You might have seen that one. You do, so like string view for arrays. That's really Is this the same cool. as GSL span, just a simple one-dimensional thing? Uh, I think so. They're still working on the multidimensional one. The, it's, it's, it's tricky to write. You know, the, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Single dimension span is easy, but the multiple di dimension one, there's considerations to take care of. Um, some some small bug fixes. Uh, you might have not noticed about that, but structured bindings only worked with public members. Yes, right. Uh, the, the, that's annoying. You, know, you you have your own private members. You cannot easily make a tuple or a pair of some of the members by using structured bindings within your own code because they're private. Oh, that's interesting. Which, I hadn't thought But you have that. access to that. You know, they're yours. You're a friend. You cannot make a structured binding out of the private and protected members of your friends. So, so, so uh, it's funny because I ran into that bug two weeks ago and a few days before I did Timur Doomler, I think, had the same bug and wrote, wrote a bug report and we managed to get that one in as a defect for plus plus 17. So as long as you have access to the members, you're allowed to destructure them, if you will. Which is really reasonable. Seriously, mm -hmm. it's a really good thing. So we managed to get that one right in because everyone agreed that we should have done that from the start. You know, it's a really good thing. Did you manage to fix the context for usage of uh, structured bindings while you were at it? You need a paper for that. Oh, come <laughs> on! Allow the context per keyword. That's all that... No, actually... Yeah. They are you allowed... You need a paper in, for that. Okay. <laughs> You need a paper for that. We only discuss things on papers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assumed someone else would have, you know, because there's so much movement with context burn. Yeah. No, people have to. Write. We, we barely have the time just to to breathe at those meetings. So, yeah, uh, yeah, and we we as I told you, some of the committees don't go through half of the papers that they really get. So we we cannot do things that are not on papers. It's not manageable. Wow. The other thing is that if it's not a paper, we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You need something in writing that you can read, reason about, examples, something that's... If it's not writing, it's, it's, not, if it's not written, it's not science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the, and you, might have, you might have liked that, the variadic lambda captures. I was looking at that, and I think I've only hacked that come up maybe once or twice that I, when I was... And I just engineered around it in some other way. Yeah, yeah, there are tricks, but the the, the fact that you can now, uh, you will now be able to do a, a global move of a pack within a lambda at capture time. That's pretty cool, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Contracts. Have you heard about contracts a bit? I, I've heard about them, and we talked to. S Who do we talk to about them? Bjarne? Maybe. Juan <sighs> de Garcia, sure. maybe. John Lakers. There's a few others. We didn't no, have John. John. We haven't had John on the show before. It, it was a while be ago. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the contracts made it to core this week. Um, it, it's a very interesting feature that I think we can hope for in C plus plus twenty. 
It, it looks good, but uh, we, you know, when you hit core, sometimes you see things you hadn't seen before. Um, so if my understanding is correct, because for the first time I was faced with that thing, contracts uh, include a, a precondition part, expects, a post-condition part, ensures, and some assertions within the code. The preconditions and the postconditions are part of the interface of the function. So you, the caller is actually aware of them. Oh, wait. The, the, yeah. Does that mean now when I deduce function types, I have that many more things to add to my templates for deducing? <laughs> no, not, not, as, not as far as I know, but it's something that can be checked by a compiler because it's part of the visible interface, and it only relies on public members if you're in a class. So okay. Because it's something that participates in the interface that's to be visible to the caller. Um, the, they can be turned on and off, that's fair, because sometimes you want them to be checked and sometimes you don't care that much. So uh, yeah, there, there's a number of good things about that. What struck us, uh, one of the reasons we were discussing that thing in core is that you might want to be debugging your assertions or your preconditions by putting, let's say, print statements in them. Now, if you do mm -hmm. I.O. or any other kind of side effect, you're, you're kind of playing against the contract because contracts are not supposed to influence the flow of the code. So if you're doing new, for example, you might be breaking things, removing memory that you might need within the function, you might be interfering with the code. So the contracts themselves are not supposed to be side effecting, but it's reasonable to let people do print statements if you want to trace their stuff. So, so, so the, the, that was part of the reason we were discussing that thing. And at some point, the fact that when you're calling a contract, and you're breaking the preconditions, you're not meeting them, the uh, people who are writing the proposal expect us, well, the compiler people, to report the point of call as being uh, uh, the place where the problem is. So you're calling from that function a function, and you're not respecting its contract. Okay. Now, that, that, that's, that's fine when you're calling the function directly. It's complicated if you're calling it through a function pointer or a mm. virtual call. <laughs> because because they're not part of the function signature, really, these things. And and, and someone realized that uh, if we want to call C functions, say, and C++ functions, well, if you want to be able to report the point of call at all time, you have to introduce a trampoline in your code and allocate memory. It becomes a very big mess. So, so I, I'm not sure we'll be able to do that part of contracts for C++20. It seems much trickier than people expected. Okay. Happily enough, though, for us, there's another proposal on the table to report actual stack traces uh, uh, when requested. So that oh. may be something that is parallel to contracts, but that might, be, that might make the code able to report stack traces nonetheless without introducing that overhead on each indirect function call. So there might be a solution for that that is outside of the contract's realm. Okay, so when you break a contract, what is the actual mechanism for what happens? Is this like a, an exception, or is it what? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know the proposal deeply enough for that. Something I would have to look for. You, uh, you can imagine, maybe perhaps, where my question is going, is what happens if you break a contract in a context for context? <laughs> Again, I, 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 I don't know the proposal enough to answer that, sadly. Okay. <laughs> it's, but the, 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 these questions, uh, what happens when you throw an exception from within a, an, um, an ensures or clause or a require, uh, or not a requires, but an expects clause? Oh. Th these questions have, have slowed down the progress of contracts quite a bit because that's where the, the, the danger is. You know, what happens when you're doing these weird things within them? <sighs> Then you have to have a syntax like constructor try blocks, which almost no one knows even exists. Well, right now, the, right, you, you do, I do, a few others do. Uh, the, right, right now, the thing is you cannot have side effects. That's already something. So they're, they're not supposed to break at any time because they're mathematical constructs. They're, they're stateless, really, if you do them well. So it shouldn't be a problem, but we'll see. Interesting. Yeah, 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 but uh, again, to know more, you should ask the authors. What, what, what I found interesting was this development that to really support contracts the way they were being brought to us, there would have been a hidden cost that we luckily cut at core. So uh, now we, we'll see where, where we go with that. That doesn't mean contracts are not good. Far from it. They're very interesting. But that right. part of it needs work a bit.
yeah, if you had not caught it at core, then we would see tweets like six months from now from compiler yeah. developers about how this thing is unimplementable and it's going to have to go back. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's implementable, but not at a reasonable cost. Right. But I think enough core is the, apart from people like me who are just there because they find it interesting, they're the compiler <laughs> writers, most of them, so they tend to see those things. Oh, that's good, right. Yeah. So that's pretty much the, the big things that I could see. It was a very interesting meeting. I have yeah. one question that you did not mention, and I am even looking yeah. at the paper, I'm at a loss. What is the version header for? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay, so there's the ISO, I think ISO 646 header that already exists that yes. tells you things about uh, the, the, your, your compiler and your machine or whatever, the, the, the tools you're using. And nobody really uses that. It's a bit of a mess in C++. I'm not even familiar with it, really. Yeah, well, it's people keep talking about it, but nobody uses it ever. But in theory, it would tell you what your installation is like. So version, if I remember properly, because it was brought up, is something you could include to know. To know, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is because it's been discussed when we're voting. I'm going to find version. There we are. So uh, the, 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 the big issue is we don't, we don't say in the proposal which symbols you will find in there. It's implementation <laughs> specific. But it's, it's meant to tell you which library you have, libcd C++ or libc++ or whatever, which version you have and everything. Uh, so, so the intent is to replace CISO 646 with 6 with something that is more useful to C++ people and tells them what the tools they have on their hands are like, version and kind of library, so that you can adapt your client code to the, uh, the do's and don'ts of your various tools. Okay, so that's a header that might tell us things, but we don't know what. It's implementation specific, yeah. Okay, now it raises the question for me of feature macros, which last I heard had not been officially accepted, but everyone agree well, almost everyone agrees is a good idea, and it sounds kind of like Something related. Stick in there, yeah. I, 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 I wasn't, I'm, I'm not the most knowledgeable one on version, but I think version is for the tools and libraries that you have, and feature macros are for the things that your compiler supports. Okay. So you can do uh, granular checks on support for concepts and support for modules and support for this with the feature test macros. Right. And version is more, well, if you're using this standard library or that standard library and you do hacks based on which one you have, that's the place where you'll find the information. So was there any movement on version, on feature macros then? I don't know. I've seen Clark Nelson. He was at the meeting at some point, but the feature macros didn't come into core, and I haven't seen any proposal uh, for yeah. that pass by. I, I've seen it mentioned in the plans for Rapper's Will, so my guess is they're going to make a decision on that in a few months. My understanding is that STL is a proponent of that, and I don't know if he was at Jacksonville. I, I, I've seen him. He was there. Oh, okay. Okay, so you just mentioned uh, Rapper's Will, so that'll be the next ISO C++ meeting. And according to the, the trip report, it looks like that and then the, the winter meeting in San Diego are going to be the final meetings on major C++ 20 features. Is that right? Yeah, you're probably looking at Bryce's paper now when you're saying that. Eh? So, so yeah. we, we, we had an agenda that Herb brought to us. It's interesting to give us a big idea on... Uh, what the dependencies were and what we are expected to provide. So yes, San Diego would be the place where the major language features will be completed. So we're hoping that the big ones are done by there. And uh, we shouldn't be adding any more features past uh, Kona. So what's called the winter meeting, it's November. So I don't know if winter is the right word for that, but it's going to be November in San Diego, which should be pretty warm still. It's a mid-fall and on the beach meeting. Yeah, kind of. Well, no, no, it's... <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I've been to Kona twice, I haven't seen the water yet. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> just too much work to do there. And the, uh, the, 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 spring co the spring meeting in Kona is February or March in 2019, so there. So we have Cologne planned for the summer and Belfast, which I'm looking forward to in November 2019. I've never been there, so. It's an interesting city. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. 
So, so yeah, we're, we're, the, the thing is, everything that goes through library evolution, we really hope it's done by the next meeting because then it has to move to library and they have to check it out and do the wording. And library is always overflowing with work because there's so much stuff going on there. So the evolutionary stuff, if we could get that through by Rapper's Will, it would be a good thing. So basically okay. one more meeting to try to get your major features done. Kind of, yeah. If they're not ready, they better be very close to it. Right. Right. But the, the, there's hope, because the big things we hope, like coroutines, modules, uh, concepts, uh, maybe networking if we're lucky, they're all pretty close. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been great having you on again, Patrice. Uh, we really love doing these trip reports with you. You're very nice. I won't be in Rapper's Wheel, so you'll need to find someone else, but I should be in San Diego. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm giving a class in Shanghai at about the same dates, so I oh, won't be able okay. to do both. It's, uh, travel-wise, it was complicated. Yeah, Shanghai to Switzerland, long flight. No, but that uh, that would be easy. That, but the rules at my institution is that it has to be Montreal, Shanghai, and then Shanghai, Montreal, and then Montreal, Switzerland. Th th that's what makes it senseless. Doesn't yeah, that's that's to... untainable. <laughs> no, I, yeah. I, at some point I have to go back home, so uh, I won't be making this one. But uh, I should be in San Diego. Okay, great. Thanks again, Patrice. Yeah, thanks Thank for you coming on. You're very nice. All right. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C plus plus. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in, or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. Podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.